Welcome. My name is George Mann, and I'm the writer of Newbreen Hobbs, Witchwood, and Star Wars The High Republic. This is Kevin Shinnick, writer of Star Wars Force Collector. I'm Kevin Scott, one of the story architects of Star Wars The High Republic. This is Dominic Pace, who plays Gekko the Bounty Hunter from The Mandalorian. Hi, I'm Claudia Gray. I write Star Wars books. And you're listening. And you are listening. And you are listening. To Star Wars Comics in Canon. The Force is strong with this one. Hello there and welcome to Star Wars Comics in Canon, your guide to the wider Star Wars canon through the comic book lens. And to take you on this journey, I'm your host, Mike Burton. And so brings episode 131. So my friends, this week I am tackling the first volume of the Yoda miniseries. So the series itself is 10 issues long. This volume is going to be issues 1 to 6. Then once issue 10 is released, I will tackle issues 7 to 10 as a part 2. Now if you haven't joined before, welcome, hope you have a good time. In short, what I do here is I'm going to go through each of these comics in chronological order, giving you the plot details as I go through them, and then along the way giving you additional information on connected contents that can be species or characters that have re-emerged, or planets, or just things that have appeared in like Legends or Canon, that kind of thing. I generally focus on the Canon here, but there are going to be connections to Legends, so I give a little bit of information when that is appropriate. But with that all in mind, let's delve into things. So this 10 issue series is actually comprised of three, technically four stories. So there's the framing story, which you only see in issues one, four, seven, and 10. The 10th one is really the culmination of that. And then the issues one, two, three is one arc, then four, five, six is another arc, and then seven, eight, nine is another arc. Issues one to three take place in the High Republic era. Issues four to six take place several decades before the prequel era. And then the third arc takes place in the Clone Wars. Now, the framing story is while Yoda is in exile, he's on Dagobah, it's before A New Hope or Empire Strikes Back. The assumption is it's kind of shortly before A New Hope slash Empire Strikes Back, but the exact timeline isn't mentioned here. Now, outside of the movies and TV shows, there's not actually that much canon Yoda content. I know in Legends there's a few comics, there's a book or two, but in canon they're slowly building things up, but there isn't actually that much. Now, one of the prominent ones is a five-issue arc in the main Star Wars run from the 2015 run, and it's called Yoda's Secret War. Now, I did tackle this in episode 33 of Star Wars Comics and Canon, so if you want to hear all about that, you can go listen to that. It's set before The Phantom Menace. Aside from that, there's a one-off Age of Rebellion story featuring Yoda. I tackled that in episode 47 of Star Wars Comics and Canon. And then he appears in the High Republic stuff. He's not actually in the High Republic that much. In phase two, he's in it a little bit. In phase one, he's in it even less. Now, if you want to find out what happened to Yoda during phase one and why he's not about for all the main events of the books and things, it is actually mentioned in the High Republic Adventures comics by IDW Publishing. I believe it's in the first volume of that, and I tackle that in episode 86 of Star Wars Comics and Canon. So if you want to find out what happened to a 664-year-old Yoda at the time of the High Republic and why he's basically not there for the majority of the content, you can go back and listen to that episode. TV show wise, there's quite a few things with Yoda. Obviously, Clone Wars, he's quite prominent in that. In series six, there's a four episode arc just all around Yoda, which is really interesting. It's one of my favorite arcs in the Clone Wars. It's all about the Force and how he kind of learns to become a Force ghost, all that stuff. It's really, really cool. And he does pop up in Rebels more than once as well. So he's always somewhat present, it seems, but he hasn't really been the front runner very much. But I think that's sort of the extended content around Yoda. So let's delve into the comics I'm tackling this week. So as I said, there are six issues of this Yoda comic that I'm tackling this week, and there's different artists and writers for each arc. So the first arc, the first three issues, is written by Kevin Scott with artwork by Nico Leon, and the colour artist is Dono Sanchez Almara. Then the second arc, so issues four to six, is written by Jody Hauser with the artist Luke Ross and the colour artist Nolan Woodard. Issue 1 was released November 23rd, 2022. Issue 6 was released April 19th, 2023. And then the trade paperback collection containing all 10 issues is due to be out late 2023. Certain websites seem to say it's October. Others say it's November or even December. So I'm just going to assume late 2023. Issue 10 comes out in a month or so. So it's going to be a few months after that. Now, before delving in, I will note here that we do not know Yoda's species. It was not mentioned in Legends. It's not been mentioned in canon. George Lucas quite liked the fact that Yoda slash Yaddle species were never mentioned. 
We currently know of three individuals of the same species that have names, and that is Yoda, Yaddle, and Grogu. Obviously, Grogu is from The Mandalorian. Yaddle is in The Phantom Menace, and then is also in Tales of the Jedi, but has been quite prominent in The High Republic, especially in the book Cataclysm, and she also has a very small role in the book Out of the Shadows. At the time of his death, Yoda was around 900 years old, which is not uncommon for his species, it seems. And Yaddle actually speaks normally in air quotes. You know how Yoda kind of speaks. He says like the second half of the sentence first, that kind of thing. That's not specifically for a species. That just seems to be him. I mean, we don't know because Grogu doesn't really speak. And then Yaddle speaks air quotes normally. And then Yoda speaks in his strange cryptic way. So really, we just need another member of the species and see how they talk, and then we can kind of work out from there. But whether or not we'll ever get that, who knows? But with that all in mind, let's delve into the first comic. So here is The Crawl. The wise Jedi Master Yoda has lived a long life in service to the greater good of the galaxy. After the rise of the Galactic Empire, he now spends his days on the secluded swamp world of Dagobah, awaiting an important visitor and reflecting on his many adventures. So on Dagobah, before Empire Strikes Back, Yoda hears a voice that seems to be from a Force ghost, but we don't know whose it is, asking to speak with him because it's important. Yoda says that peace is important, and then we get a flashback. So before delving into the flashback, let's just give a little bit more information about Dagobah. Dagobah has 23 hour days, approximately 341 days in a year, and Yoda built his hut from an E3 standard starship lifeboat, which he built into the Gnarl Tree. Now, one of my favourite bits of trivia about Dagobah is actually linking in with probably my favourite one-shot, if not one of my favourite one-shots. As people may be aware, I'm not overly a fan of one-shot comics. If they're, like, quite big and there's a reason to them or they're, like, an event comic, it's slightly different. But when it's, like, an anthology series, I'm generally not as much of a fan of it, especially when it focuses on main characters from the movies that we already know loads about because you can't really add too much to them. But... There is an Age of Resistance story, which is Age of Resistance Snoke. It all centers around Kylo Ren, but it's a story of Kylo Ren goes to Dagobah and goes into the Dark Side Cave. And it's really, really interesting. I highly recommend that issue. Kylo Ren does actually try and destroy the cave at the end of the comic, so it may not be there post-sequel trilogy. But if you want to hear a little bit more about that in more detail, check out episode 52 of Star Wars Comics and Canon, because I delve into that story, as well as the rest of the Age of Resistance villains stories. Now, I could almost do an entire podcast just on Dagobah, all the fauna that lives there, and the history of it, both in canon and legends, but this is about the Yoda comic series, and although the framing story is Dagobah, we don't actually see him in Dagobah that much until I think issue 10 is going to feature primarily on there. So, with that all in mind, let's delve into this flashback. So, this flashback takes place around the time of the High Republic, so it seems to take place a few decades before Light of the Jedi. So, it's between Phase 1 and Phase 2, in essence, because for people who aren't aware... Phase 1 is around 200 years before The Phantom Menace. Phase 2 is around 150 years before that, which means it's 350 years before The Phantom Menace. And due to certain story beats and certain characters that are in this and things, you can get a gist of when this comic is set. And as I said, it seems to be a few years, maybe a decade or two, before the events of Light of the Jedi. But as we go through this flashback, there is time that passes, so it's just a loose estimate. With that in mind, let's delve in. So it starts off with a young Scalvy called Bree, who's trying to use parts from an old small ship to help with chores, trying to like, automate things and stuff. So a Scalvy, I believe, has only been created for this specific comic. They are purple-skinned near-humans. They have three fingers, one thumb, pointed ears, but the rest of them look quite human. Now this young Scalvy Bree, he seems to be, I guess I'd say like 10, maybe 14 years old, and he's there trying to sort out of this old ship, as I said, and he's there with what I believe is his sister, and then an alarm sounds and the Krulcon attack. So Krulcon are another new species. They are not dissimilar to Scalvi, but they're less close to humans, so they're much more humanoid. They are red-skinned, they have big claws, and they are bulkier than the Scalvi. So the Krulcon are attacking from the water. They have ships and things with cannons and etc. and blasters, and Bree and his sister run away from the shootout that's going on, and Bree tries to use the communications on that old ship he's been fixing up just to beg for help from anyone across the galaxy. So then we see where that message goes. It's received at the Jedi Temple on Coruscant, and then after a minor debate between Pratri Vita, Yoda, and Ila Sutan, Yoda says that he will go. So a smidge to unpack there. So Coruscant. Coruscant's quite an interesting one because it was actually named by Timothy Zahn, who wrote the Heir to the Empire trilogy, as well as the Canon Thrawn novels and lots of other things as well in Star Wars. He's obviously someone that people attribute the Legends continuity kind of spring-loading of the Heir to the Empire trilogy. Granted, there was content before that, like Alan Foster's Splinter of the Mind's Eye, as well as the Marvel comics as well, but the Heir to the Empire trilogy were really the big hitters. So Zahn actually named Coruscant in the Heir to the Empire book. 
Before that, it had only been referred to as like Imperial Center, and Zahn said, well, I wouldn't call it Imperial Center because it's a planet. It'd be, it'd be called an actual name. You wouldn't just keep calling it Imperial Center, especially after Return of the Jedi. So he actually created that name, and then George Lucas liked it so much, he decided to use it in the prequels. And obviously, it's just a common name that everyone recognizes now. Obviously, in Legends, it kind of set that precedent, but I didn't realize that until recently, so that's really, really cool. But a bit of information about Coruscant. So there are one trillion people living on there. It's 24-hour days, 365 days a year. I wonder why that is. And is defined as an ecumenopolis, which really just means there's not really any nature left on the planet. It's all cityscape. And also, the city is made up of loads of different levels. It goes down like thousands and thousands of levels. And the further down you go, generally the poorer people are, generally the less high standing they are in society, those sorts of things. And that kind of element is tackled all across Star Wars canon and in Legends. It's in the Clone Wars, it's in loads of comics, it's, it's basically everywhere. People, it's just a very common thing about Coruscant. And Coruscant is known as kind of the centre of the galaxy, although it's not technically the centre of the galaxy, but it's among the centre. And it's the centre of the core worlds. So you've got the core worlds who are meant to be the most civilised in a way. You've got Corellia there, you've got Coruscant there, you know, those sorts of planets. And then you go out to the mid rim, and then you go out to the outer rim, and then beyond that is like wild space, or the unknown regions, or, you know, there's a variety of different names for it. And then one other fun thing about Coruscant, as people would have seen, I believe, you see it in Andor, and I think you see it in Mandalorian Series 3 as well. I have a feeling, I think it's in Clone Wars as well. Essentially, the last mountain that's left on Coruscant can actually be seen in the main city. So there's parts in the shows where people walk up to it, and it's essentially like, it's several meters in diameter, but it's just the tip top of a mountain just kind of sticking out of this vast cityscape. And it's, it's a really cool idea. I quite like it. I wonder if when we get this film that's going to be coming out in a few years' time, the Dawn of the Jedi kind of stuff, like 25,000 years before the Skywalker saga, I wonder if they're going to delve into stuff to do with Coruscant and show how it was 25,000 years ago. But, don't know. I just love that little concept. So moving on from Coruscant, we've got Pra Tree Vita. Now, Pra Tree Vita is a Tarnab. So Tarnab, they're, I guess, humanoid, loosely, but they have quite dark skin. They've got like pointed ears slash horns, like a triangle skull. Their nose is up, kind of like a bat. It's almost like a bat person, but not quite like a Chadra fan who's only a couple of feet tall, but like a tall, mature Chadra fan, I guess. In canon, they're not really in it that much. You get to see them in the Clone Wars. You do see one in the prequel trilogy. You see one in the Clone Wars. And you do see them in the High Republic primarily because of Pratri Vita. But even in Legends, there's not actually that much of them. Obviously, they're in the prequels, and then they were mentioned in Plagueis and Cloak of Deception, as well as Star Wars Republic Show of the Force. But aside from that, not really elsewhere. So they've basically just been like this backgroundy species. Like there's a galactic senator called Mot Not Rab, who is the person represented that was shown in the prequel trilogy. And then I believe that they were shown a little bit in the Clone Wars and stuff. But yeah, Pratri Vita is from the High Republic era. Now, at this point in the comics, Pratri Vita is a newer member of the Jedi Council. However, in the High Republic era, around like the Jedi, that sort of thing, he is known as the Grand Master. Now, there's actually several Grand Masters, because I think there's been a degree of debate in the Star Wars realm, both in Legends and in Canon, because in the time of the prequel trilogy, Yoda was the Grand Master, but also Mace Windu was as well. I think he had a slightly different title, but they're kind of one in the same. And then at this point, Yoda is the Grand Master. But also, at the point of like the Jedi, Yoda is still the Grand Master, but so is Pratri Vita. And there's 12 members of the Jedi Council, so I think it's just Yoda kind of is one because he's just been there for so long, and then you've also got like a secondary one. So it's almost like Yoda's got it out of respect, but there's normally one below him that kind of does a bit more of the responsibilities they have. Yoda can kind of do what he wants, as we'll go into in this comic. And then the last person to mention is Ella Satan, E-L-A space S-U-T-A-N. Now, Ella does actually appear in the Path of Vengeance book, which I'm reading at the moment, but the species is a Kamasi, C-A-A-M-A-S-I. Now, it was actually first in the Rogue One comic, so it was a one-shot, and it was about how Cassian Andor met K2SO. Now, I'm fairly certain they're going to wreck on this, because the, the comic's all right, it's not bad, but it doesn't really add anything. I tackled it many moons ago in Star Wars Comics and Canon. I think it was in the first sort of 40 episodes or so. It was a fun one. I think it was a double along with the Tobias Beckett one shot, I believe. But anyway, the Car Marcy, so they're kind of like a snouted mammalian humanoid, and they were actually first in Legends. They were first in Timothy Zahn's Spectre of the Past, which is the first book in the Hand of Thrawn duology. So again, Timothy Zahn creating a lot of stuff. I think there's a lot of background information that I've just thrown at you, so let's delve right back into the story. 
So on this planet that the Scalvi are from, where they sent out this distress signal, which obviously the Jedi Council heard, the planet itself is called Turak, T-U-R-R-A-K. There is another raid on this village of the Scalvi, but Yoda goes there and saves Bree and their family by essentially being a badass. The action scenes in this comic are amazing. In fact, the, the visuals in all of these Yoda comics are really, really good. And there's a couple of really cute moments I really like. There's a couple of more heart-hitting moments, but the action scenes, especially in this issue, are amazing. So... Yoda destroys essentially all the weapons from all of these raiders. He knocks them out. He doesn't kill anyone. He likes flipping around, kind of as we saw in Attack of the Clones when he's fighting Dooku. He's like jumping off people, flipping around. All you can almost see is like a blur of this green lightsaber. And then weapons are flinging in the air because he's using the force on them. He's like force pushing people through stuff. He's doing all that stuff. Then one of the Skulkan leaders enters with a custom walker. So it's kind of like an ATST, also known as the chicken walkers. You know, it's basically a box of two legs. Kind of like that, but a mishmashed version of it. It fires, it does hit Yoda, but it doesn't do a direct hit, and he just gets knocked over and gets up. And he's maybe a little bit wounded, but he's not like severely wounded. He throws his lightsaber, which cuts through parts of the walker. It knocks it over, and then the leader, who's called Ryak, R-I-A-K, falls out. Bree then goes over to Ryak, picks up his weapon that's like this big axe thing that uh, Ryak was holding, is about to slam it down onto the neck of Ryak, but Yoda uses the force to stop him. Yoda then tells the Krolkon to leave, and, and the Krolkon are like, oh, well, you won't be here forever, and Yoda says, well, actually, I will. I'll stay here to protect. So he sends a Corio droid to the council, noting that he's going to stay on Turak for as long as it takes. Now, the Corio droids are something which are part of the High Republic, more so into the Phase Two era, but essentially in the era of the High Republic, communications weren't perfect. The way communications got sent across well, the galaxies and across all of the universe was by like communication boys in essence. So like satellites in a way. It's kind of not dissimilar to how I assume it works here. But often if the signal wasn't ideal or if it was really sensitive information or things like that, what happened is you give a message to a droid and then the droid who could survive in space and stuff would just zoom off and then go deliver a message. So the council do receive this message and they read it and obviously he says he's going to stay there as long as he takes. They're a little bit confused, but obviously they trust Yoda's judgment because he's so wise, so they leave him to it. So this first issue ends with Yoda being sat by the fire, listening to the Scalvi's music. And while that's happening, the Krolkons are watching from afar and Ryak, the leader, says that Yoda and his new home will burn. He doesn't call Yoda Yoda, I don't think he knows Yoda's name, but he basically says that. So then we move on to Issue number two, so this is the second of the three in this comic arc, which is Light and Life, the name of these first three issues, and then we'll delve onto the other one as we get there. But issue two, it starts off with Pratri, Vita, and Ela talking to Yoda in person. He's come off the planet Turak and has gone to speak with them on like a nearby space station. Pratri wants Yoda to come back, but Yoda's not really paying attention to what he's saying. He's just showing off this new musical instrument that he's been playing called the Tarati. And it might be my favourite panel in this entire comic run so far. It's got really nothing to do with anything else. I posted it on social media a little while back. And when I do a post of this episode, I'll try to remember to include that panel. But I just found it so funny because you've got Yoda, who at this point is, I think, six to seven hundred years old. And he's very well respected. And they're trying to talk to him seriously, being like, you know, Yoda, we need you for this. We need you for that. And Ela does mention that Yoda, when he is actually needed, does come back and do stuff for the council but he is spending the majority of his time on Turak. Like, most Jedi have the, the temple on Coruscant as their main hub, so they go off and do missions, and when they're done, they come back to the hub in Coruscant, and then they kind of mill around, do whatever, before going off to their mission. Whereas what Yoda does is when he's done with the mission, he goes back to Turak. And so they're trying to talk to him quite seriously, mainly Pra Trivita. Elar is a little bit more accepting of Yoda, and it's like, we should respect Yoda, he's fine, he knows what he's doing. Whereas Pra Tri is like, we need you back, we've got stuff going on. And then they're trying to talk to him seriously, and Yoda just is like, hey, look at this musical instrument I can play. And Pratri's like, um, okay, that's cool. And, he, and Yoda's like, yeah, I'm not very good at playing it yet, but I'm sure I'll get better. And it's just this image of just these two Jedi Masters looking down at Yoda, slightly concerned, thinking he's probably gone, like, maybe a little bit senile, like he's losing his marbles a little bit, because he's just playing with this little musical instrument. It's like almost a music box or like a hand, like a, a little keyboard almost, but only for your hand. It's quite interesting. I just think it's so funny. I know I'm going on about it and it's got real, almost nothing to do with the plot. I just find it so entertaining. So if there's any reason to pick up these comics, and obviously I always suggest to people to pick up these comics where you can, but just that one panel just really, really tickled me. So after a little bit of conversation between Yoda, Pratri and Ila, Yoda obviously returns to Turak. And the Scalvi have built themselves a watchtower. One of them makes a comment about Yoda not helping with it. And he says, no, you need to be able to do this stuff by yourself. I'm not here just to do everything for you. 
Then a couple of people near the top like knock something and then it falls and it's about to hit someone and Yoda uses the force to save their life. And then one of the Scalvi makes a comment saying they're not ready for you to leave yet. So while this is going on, we then see what the Council are talking about in Yoda's absence. And they are becoming increasingly concerned by Yoda's time with the Scalvi. And as I said, it's just furthering somewhat their frustrations because obviously they want Yoda to do these Jedi responsibilities and stuff. And he's just having none of it because you can't really tell Yoda what to do. So then back on Scalvi, the Krollcons attack again. Now, Bree has actually got a device, which he says can actually help. But one of these, don't want to call it a thug, it's like a guard, but it's like a really big, burly person. And they're one of like the defenders, one of the guards. But the guards refuses to use it. So he like runs at the Krollcon with a weapon, gets immediately KO'd. And then Bree turns around and looking to Yoda for help. But Yoda's gone. So Bree manages to scramble, he finds this device, and he activates it. Now, in activating this device, it sends out this noise. I assume it's like a high-pitched frequency or something. The Scalvi are essentially unaffected by this, but it really hurts the Krokons, who all just flee and run away. They then decide to try and find out where Yoda's gone, and they find Yoda's lightsaber. And they know, well, clearly Yoda wouldn't have left this behind. And they find the lightsaber near a Krolcom barge. So the three kids who have gone off to do this, Bree, his sister, and someone else, decide to go and save Yoda. So they grab his lightsaber as well as some weapons left on this barge and go to rescue Yoda without telling anyone. Yoda is on this Krolkon facility and he is tied up, but the Krolkons are demanding that he helps them as he helped the Scalvi. The Scalvi then show up and then there's like a shootout that occurs, a bit of action and things. Bree does eventually get to Yoda and Yoda points above. Bree then sees there are starving children up near the top and then attacks Ryuk in anger. Or Ryak, Ryuk, I can't remember how he pronounced it. R-I-A-K, the leader of the Krolkon. When Bree is attacking this leader, he's doing it in anger and he's calling them animals and things, being like, how can you treat your children like this? All that kind of stuff. Yoda's trying to calm him down, is trying to stop him doing this. But before Yoda can really stop anything, Bree stabs Ryuk through the chest with Yoda's lightsaber, seemingly killing him. And that is where issue two ends. And Yoda is very disappointed by this. So then we move on to issue three. And it is shown that it is years later. It really seems to be decades later, if I'm honest. I'd say probably 20 years, maybe even 30. I don't know how Scalvy age, but that's the general gist. There are kids around who are reenacting Bree killing that Krolken leader, and they call him Uncle Bree. Now, he walks in and is mad about this. And so the kid's mother, who I assume is Bree's sister, says that they don't know the whole story about what's going on, and they are upset Uncle Bree talking about this. Then we get to see what actually happened. So after Bree killed Ryuk, the Scalvi are all celebrating. They're like, oh, you've saved us on the Krokon and stuff. But Yoda leaves. He doesn't say anything. He just walks away. Bree catches up with him and says, what are you doing? I saved you. And Yoda's like, I was never in any danger. It was all a test and you failed. And Yoda just left the planet and then no one had seen Yoda since. And it's been like decades. And now Bree is obviously still upset by these things because he says they should have listened to Yoda more. They should have listened to the teachings. And then, as if by magic, obviously it's the Force, Yoda then appears and he shows that he's improved playing the Tarati, which is that little musical instrument that just tickled me so much. And Bree is just really relieved by seeing Yoda again. But then, an alarm sounds. Bree asks Yoda, like, what to do, and surely you showed up because of this thing, and Yoda just doesn't really respond and keeps playing with his little musical instrument. So Bree decides to take matters into his own hands, as they have been doing, and he tells the Scalvi to get the defences set up. Now, his nephew and friends, the ones who are reenacting this uh, killing of the Krokon leader, decide to ignore Bree, and they want to go and fight the Krokon themselves. Yoda tries to convince them otherwise and says, you know, maybe you should listen to them and stuff like that. And the kids just don't really care. And then when Yoda's out of earshot, they continue and go to try and take on the Krokon. So they get to the Krokon compound and they decide to kidnap a young girl who's even younger than they are. And the Krokon leaders, they come back from yet another failed fishing attempt. And then the Krokon leader finds that the daughter's been kidnapped. Back at the Scalvi camp, Bree then finds this kidnapped child and says they need to release her immediately. But his nephew who captured her runs away. The Krokons are then calling to the Scalvi from the water, demanding their child back. And the Scalvi are antagonizing them and open the gates to start a fight. And Yoda says he doesn't agree with what's going on, but he will stay by his promise and he will stand with the Scalvi. But Bree says not to. Bree stops the conflict. And I'll say there's quite interesting dialogue between the Scalvi and the Krokon leader. Because the Krokon are saying, look, we left you alone and you decide to come over after like decades of peace and decide to kidnap my daughter. Like, what on earth are you doing? We're going to have to get her back. But when Bree stops his conflict, he gives the child back, says, look, completely unharmed, I'm really sorry this happened. And then he tells everyone of the Scalvi that the Krokon are starving, that they all need to share, that they need to open the gates for their neighbours and let them in. So Bree finally passed the test. And that was what Yoda seemingly was there for. 
So then as this comic ends, we see Yoda tells Pra Tree Vita he's coming home now, he's not going to go back to Turek, but Yoda does note that there's no fish in the oceans at all on Turek, and that's one of the issues here, which is the Krolken were actually starving. They weren't trying to starve their children, as we were led to believe in one of the prior issues. It was actually that they just had no food. And the reason they kept attacking the Scalvi is because the Scalvi were generally the land beings, and the Krolken were generally confined to the ocean. But they couldn't fish. There was, no, there was nothing there. There was just no aquatic life at all. So that's why they were starving and so desperate to attack all the time. So Pratri Vita, he says to Yoda, I apologize for questioning you. I know that this is what the Will of the Force wanted. And thank you for staying true and doing all that sort of stuff. But after hearing about the oceans being completely empty, and Yoda says it's quite weird, it's quite peculiar, that's not standard. And he asks if Pratri Vita will get a Republic force sent down there, like an environmental team, to try and help out, to try and find out why there's no life, or maybe introduce some more life, just to kind of lend a final hand for the beings living on Turek. And then the final panels of this comic show that the Scalvi and the Krolkon are sitting at a table all together and they are feasting together. And it's just a really nice way to end the arc of Light and Life. So with that in mind, we move on to the second story arc. So the second story arc is called Students of the Force and it starts with issue number four. So issue four starts once again on Dagobah and that ghostly force ghost whatever voice calls to Yoda once again and then Yoda again ignores it and just wanders off into the swamps of Dagobah. And then we get another flashback. So it flashes back to Coruscant years ago, and you've got Yoda asks Dooku to help him teach in the temple. Obviously, one of Yoda's favorite things to do in the Jedi Order is to teach younglings and initiates. He's obviously had Padawans in the past, but from what I can remember, I believe that Dooku was his last Padawan. Now, the timing of this, this is obviously before Dooku left the Jedi Order. It's before his hair started going gray and things. He still has his curved hilt lightsaber, which is amazing, but Dooku left the order around 10 years before the Phantom Menace. He was still obviously friendly with that. We got to see in Tales of the Jedi and obviously all the stuff that was going on behind the scenes, but it seems to be around 10 years before the Phantom Menace and Qui-Gon isn't around, So, in, at least in these comics. So I would presume that he's no longer got Qui-Gon as a Padawan. Qui-Gon's off being a Jedi Knight by himself, but it's before Qui-Gon got Obi-Wan as Apprentice, maybe. Sort of by the time of Phantom Menace, Obi-Wan was about 25 years old and I believe that he was around 14 to 16 years old in the Padawan book when he was taken by Qui-Gon to be an apprentice. So it seems to be about 10-ish years before The Phantom Menace was when Qui-Gon took on Obi-Wan as a Padawan. So assumedly there was like 10, maybe 20 years before that time when Qui-Gon didn't have an apprentice and was just out jedi across the galaxy. It's a very long-winded way of saying I think this story takes place around 10 to maybe 20 years before the events of Phantom Menace. So that put it in the timeline between 52 and 42 years before the Battle of Yavin. So back to the story. So obviously Yoda and Dooku are speaking about Dooku trying to teach and things. And Yoda makes a comment saying that Dooku was perhaps the best Padawan in that generation. And after sort of a bit of back and forth and Yoda saying how important it would be, Dooku's like, yeah, I'm really busy with being on the council and I've got a lot of these political things going on. And Yoda's like, yeah, you are really good at your political matters and speaking with politicians and senators and etc. But this would be really, really helpful. And then you see that Yoda kind of thinks to himself that it would actually be really helpful for Dooku as well to teach and see some of the future. Because much like certain other people like Anakin, Dooku doesn't focus on the present enough. He lingers on the past or he looks too far into the future and he's not really focusing on what's happening now. And Yoda's hoping that this teaching will help him stay in the present a bit more. So Dooku does agree to teach for a time at the temple. And also linking in with Dooku thinking about the past quite a lot, it's because of his family on Sereno. Now, if you want to hear a little bit more information about that, I actually delve into Dooku's life in episode 26 of Star Wars Comics and Canon. Now, I will put a little caveat there that I recorded the episode before Tales of the Jedi came out. So there is a little bit of information that's not necessarily wrong, but I was like, I don't know when Dooku left the Order. We haven't got a specific time, but obviously in Tales of the Jedi, we get a little bit more information. We get more stuff that goes on. But if you want to hear more about Dooku and there's an audio drama called Dooku Jedi Lost, which is about Dooku and Asajj Ventress. That's quite interesting, and you get a lot of flashbacks of Dooku. You've got a lot of his relationship with Sifo Diaz. Sifo Diaz is the Jedi who allegedly commissioned the clone army on Kamino, but it seemed to be he kind of did, but it was like Dooku who was kind of pulling the strings a little bit. It's a whole conspiracy thing. It gets mentioned in the uh, Clone Wars. I think it's series six, I think, is when the uh, the clone conspiracy arc comes in, when you learn about like the chips in their heads and all that jazz. So if you want to hear more about that, go to episode 26 of Star Wars Comics in Canon. And you can also listen to the book review I did of Master and Apprentice. That's episode 28 of Star Wars Comics in Canon. I think it's the only book review where I called it an episode number because all my other book reviews are not episodic numbers. 
because in Master and Apprentice, you get quite a few flashback chapters from the perception of Qui-Gon when he was Dooku's apprentice. And you also meet Dooku's other apprentice, Rael Avaros, who is one of my favourite characters. And just a little bit more information about Dooku while I'm on him. So obviously, yep, he had the two Padawans, you know, Rael Avaros and Qui-Gon. He was obviously Yoda's Padawan. And the most amount of backstory is in the audio drama, Dooku Jedi Lost, so I would recommend that. And then at the time of his death in Revenge of the Sith, he was approximately 83 years old. So at this point, he's probably late 40s, maybe 50s or so, I would guess. But anyway, back to the story. So Yoda introduces Dooku to the initiates. So initiates are generally, so you get younglings who learn about the Force and lightsabers and all that kind of stuff, you know, really young. You saw them in Attack of the Clones a bit when Obi-Wan approaches Yoda about not being able to find Kamino. So you get the younglings there and then they grow up a little bit and then I think they become initiates and initiates are essentially, they're the age where they're no longer a youngling, but they're not technically a Padawan because an initiate has to be chosen by a Jedi to be taken on as a Padawan learner. This is before the Clone Wars where it got a little bit more hazy and people kind of assigned Padawans a bit more. But in essence, initiates would do sparring and force ability stuff and there'd just be groups of them and then prospective Jedi Masters will then look on these initiates and then would usually choose one and then that's how you get a Padawan learner. So anyway, Yoda introduces Dooku to these initiates who are training with lightsabers and Yoda and Dooku decide to give a demonstration. We get to see one or two lightsaber clashes but then we don't really get to see much after that which is a little bit disappointing. I'd love to see a proper Dooku and Yoda fight sort of pre-Attack of the Clones but anyway. Dooku notes to Yoda that a Trandoshan Jedi is actually quite uncommon and then he notes that obviously there's a rivalry between Trandoshans and Wookiees but Yoda says, you know, without the anger and the prejudice of the galaxy, this is possible. Now, to clarify, Trandoshans are the species that Bosk is, as well as Skier from the High Republic, and obviously everyone should know what a Wookiee is, Chewbacca. So there are three kind of primary Padawans that get focused on in this story arc. You've got a Trandoshan, you've got the Wookiee, and you've got a Tagonian. So a Tagonian is kind of like a feline humanoid cat person almost. They're mentioned in the Thrawn books and Dooku Jedi Lost. They were first in Legends in the first Han Solo book, The Paradise Snare, but they've not been in stuff that much, but yeah, just feline cat person. And the name of each of these, the Wookiee is called Kursish, the Trandoshan is called Gaia, and the Tagorian is called Jaxin. And just a quick note here that I forgot to add in the episode at the normal recording, the character Jackson is actually in another comic before these Yoda comics. He was actually in the Age of Republic Dooku 1 comic, which I think I delved into in the aforementioned Dooku episode in episode 26 of Star Wars Comics in Canon. But Dooku actually meets up with Jackson years later. And a little spoiler here for this one shot comic, Dooku actually kills Jackson as well. So I didn't realize that connection until I did a little bit of research afterwards. So I just wanted to add that in there. So these three Padawans are talking about the duel that they just witnessed between Yoda and Dooku. And meanwhile, Yoda notes to Dooku that Kursish, the Wookiee, is too driven. He's got good friends and things, but it's a bit too much drive in him in the wrong ways. And he actually says it's a little bit like Dooku and Sifo Diaz, like the friendship that Kursish has with Gaia and Jackson. Dooku then gets a little bit annoyed by the mention of Sifo Diaz, not directly at Yoda, but you can kind of see like a vibe change because Dooku and Sifo Diaz were very, very close, especially when they were Padawans and things. But essentially, Sifo Diaz kept having visions and they were becoming so intense and too much. He was having, it was almost like a force seizure and he was having them so frequently. And the Jedi Order not only didn't listen to what any of the visions were, I believe he saw the fall of the Jedi. I believe he saw like a lot of stuff that does actually come true. But the Jedi just won't have none of it. They wouldn't look into things. And in Dooku Jedi Lost, there's one point where he has a vision of this like cataclysmic event occurring and the Jedi Order don't want to do anything about it. But Dooku forces them and then I think he goes with Yoda and then the cataclysmic event happens. And because of Dooku, Sifo Diaz and Yoda being there, they do manage to save quite a few people. But it actually then turns out that the only reason the Jedi really accepted going there, I believe it was because that planet in question had a lot of back to there. So it's actually more of a political thing and a resource thing rather than actually listening to Sifo Diaz. And that's one of the contributing factors as to why Dooku eventually left the Order. But the reason I'm mentioning this is because Dooku notes to Yoda that they should reassess the handling of Sifo Diaz. You know, visions of the Force and things could be trying to tell them something. Yoda is unsure by this and doesn't really see much else about it. And then the scene changes. So you then see Kursish, and he has a vision. He sees lots of Trandoshans fighting Wookiees and things. There's a bit of death. He sees Yoda with the Wookiees. But he also sees Gaia, his Trandoshan friend, going to attack him, lifting a lightsaber up and going for him. He also wakes up in a sweat and then goes to the archives to try and look into these things. Dooku happens to be in the archives at the same time and sees Kursish doing stuff. So he goes over there and says, hey, what are you doing? How can I help? And Kursish is a little bit apprehensive, but he does eventually tell Dooku about his visions. 
And this was actually his first vision he ever had. And Dooku said, well, that's very impressive. You know, some people never have visions, but you need to keep this to yourself because the Jedi don't actually look kindly on those who have visions and especially not on those who act on those visions. So just keep it to yourself, especially from Yoda and just process things. It may come true. It may not, but just kind of figure things out. And the comic ends with Kursish walking into one of the Jedi training rooms and he shoves past Gaia and Gaia and Jackson are looking at each other, very confused as to what's going on. But that is where issue number four ends. So for issue five, it starts off with years previously to the flashbacks that we've been seeing, probably about 10 or so years prior. Yoda is on the moon of Alanis Prime as Wookiees called Yoda. So the Wookiees have found a Force-sensitive baby who is a Trandoshan, and it basically, after two hunting parties collided, a Trandoshan hunting party and a Wookiee hunting party collided, lots and lots of death, but the Wookiee hunting team was bigger than the Trandoshan hunting team, so the Wookiees came out on top. But the Wookiees found this Trandoshan baby, and they called the Jedi Order because they noticed that she has a gift. And so, Yoda takes the child. Now, Alanis Prime is one of the many moons around Alanis, which is actually in the Kashyyyk Sector. Now, in the Kashyyyk Sector, you've got the planet of Trandosha, obviously where the Trandoshans are from, which further adds to the rivalry between the Wookiees and the Trandoshans because they're in the same system and things. Now, Alanis Prime doesn't really seem to be elsewhere that much, but Alanis itself, as like this system, was first in Return to Vader's Castle number four, plus it was in Monster of Temple Peak. Both of those were written by Kevin Scott, and I delved into Monster of Temple Peak in episode 87 of Comics and Canon, so if you want a little bit more information on that, go to that episode. But in Legends, there was actually Alanis in there. It was in the Clone Wars game, but it was actually first in the Galactic Battlegrounds game. And it was in like a couple of books and things as well, but it's not one of those systems that's been hugely explored in Canon or in Legends. So then it shows it is 12 years later. So earlier when I said 10 years, I should have said 12 years. But 12 years later, it is Gare. So Gare is the Trandoshan baby that Yoda found, or rather was given to by the Wookiees. So Gare is sparring with Jackson, and she manages to beat Jackson. Kerr makes like a mean comment and shoves Gare, saying that clearly Gare enjoys hurting people, and Gare's like, what on earth are you on about? And the session ends, and Yoda says to Kersish, can you stay back and just speak for a little bit? So Yoda says that he senses something is amiss, but he notes that you don't have to be friends with all the Jedi, but you still have to respect them all. The temple is no place for any kind of rivalry between the Wookiees, Trandoshans, or anything like that, and that Kursish should actually note that the reason this Trandoshan is here is because the Wookiees saved the baby. So even Wookiees can see past this sometimes, and the Wookiees are the reason that Gaia is here, so he really needs to reflect on that. Kursish then has a think about things and goes and apologises to Gaia, and they hug. Then, that evening, Kursish has yet another vision, but it's purely about Gaia, and it's about her attacking him. So Kursish goes and finds Yoda, asks if Dooku is still around, and Yoda's like, well he is, yeah, if you want to go find him. So he does. He speaks to Dooku, and Dooku says that the Force seems to be warning him, but he needs to have patience. If the Force is continually telling him something, he needs to watch, he needs to learn, and if the accusations that are being seen in the Force vision are actually correct, he needs to gather evidence on this for when it does happen. But Dooku does know that the vision may come true, but it also may not come true. But he says that if it does come true, you need to be prepared to act. So we then get quite a few panels showing that Kursish is watching Gaia through like training a lot. When they're eating dinner, he's kind of looking at her suspiciously. No one seems to know what's going on. It's just Kursish who is kind of taking note of these things. Then Yoda takes the initiates to Corvair 2 to be surrounded by the force for one of the trials that they have to do. So the trial is essentially to see how all these initiates do by themselves when left alone on a nice force planet. And Yoda, while he leaves them to it, goes off and meditates to himself. When they're alone, Kursish then talks to Gaia and asks if they can speak privately. So they go and do that, and Kursish then speaks about the vision to Gaia, and then suddenly just attacks her. They then tussle, they're like throwing each other around using the force and things, but then Kursish ignites his lightsaber and goes straight for Gaia. And I will note that the Corvair 2 is not seemingly anywhere else in the canon, but the Corvair Sector did appear briefly in the Age of Republic story Anakin, and also the TIE Fighter comics as well. So with Kursish going to attack Gaia, that is where issue number 5 ends, so we move on to the final issue of this batch, and I will remind everyone that there's going to be a part 2 to this, because there's going to be 4 more issues out. They're not currently out at the moment, I think issue 9 is due to come in the next couple weeks, Once I get issue 10 in my hands, then I will release another episode of this to continue this. So I imagine it will be another month or two before you guys hear the end of that. But obviously, pick up the comics and you'll be up to date. 
So issue six starts with Yoda sensing some conflict. So he gets out from meditation and then walks over to where he senses this coming from. Kursish is obviously going for Gaia and Jackson manages to save Gaia from being hit by a fatal blow. But in doing so, Kursish actually wounds Jackson's arm. Kursish then calls Gaia a monster and then she ignites her lightsaber and then they clash. They have more fighting with lightsabers and things, but Kursish is fueled by anger and potentially even the dark side and does manage to overcome Gaia and then gets on top of her. Yoda then appears and Kursish says that he can sense the dark side in Gaia. Yoda then says, well, can you sense the dark side in me? And Kursish is looking quite confused. And Yoda explains that there's dark side in all of us. Part of the Jedi's journey is to know this, address this, but to not act upon these dark side urges and keep to the light. That's the point of the Jedi. And Yoda then questions about his actions from the visions. And he's saying like, so the vision that you've had, this has come true, yes? And Kursish is like, well, no. And he's like, okay, so you're acting upon things you don't know are happening and you're acting in the wrong way about this. And then he has a small move of his hand and then Kursish gets force pushed off of Gare and they get separated a little bit. Gare is actually fine by this, a little shaken up, but she's okay. And they return to the temple. So Yoda goes and speaks to Dooku about this, specifically about Kursish's vision. And Dooku knows about the vision and things and Yoda's a little bit annoyed about this. And Yoda and Dooku kind of clash a little bit. You know, they're having like a bit of a back and forth and Dooku's like, well, you know what happens if people talk about their visions and you know about this. I didn't tell him to act. I just said to probably not tell anyone because I didn't want the same thing happening to him as Sifo Diaz. And while they're having this conversation, it is in front of the Great Tree, which is an Uneti tree. So the Uneti tree is a Force-sensitive tree, and it's actually in the Shattered Empire comic, which I think I tackled in episode 4 of Star Wars Comics in canon, because when the Empire took over, uh, they didn't obviously care about the Jedi Order and the big tree, so I think they like split it apart, and there was like pieces of it, and Luke actually managed to retrieve a piece of this, and then plants it on Yavin 4, which is where Shara Bay and Kez Dameron make a life, and that is where Poe Dameron grows up. But anytime the Uneti tree comes up, I really like it. I quite like the idea of a force sensitive tree. It's quite cool. So after Yoda and Dooku have like an intellectual clash in a way, Gaia then decides to speak to Yoda. And Gaia says that she wants to leave the Jedi Order because it will help out Kursish. She's like, well, if Kursish can't keep a hold of these things, I don't want Kursish's life being ruined by this vision. And I don't want it to always be about me and him and this kind of clash we've had. So she wants to leave to ensure the vision can't come true under any circumstance. and. Yoda says, but if you leave, you can't come back. You can't be a Jedi afterwards if you change your mind. And she says she knows. And she wants to go off with Dooku and go on like more diplomatic missions and things like that. And obviously Yoda can't stop her, so he just accepts it. And then you get Yoda kind of pondering and thinking to himself. So he thinks about his failings to see clearly and of visions and whatnot, and that he thought he knew Gaia's fate. You know, when he rescued Gaia with the Wookiees, he was like, oh, clearly she's going to become a Jedi and he knows her path. And that lesson taught him that he doesn't know everything he thought, that the Force is constantly trying to humble him. And so Yoda thinks that he failed her. He failed Gair as a teacher. He failed Kursish. He is just failed as a master. And that's not the only time. It's not the first time he failed as a master, and it's not the last time that he failed as a master. And then the final parts of this comic, as we come to an end, it is back on Dagobah. So Yoda thinks about you know failing of the students and things, the stuff I just mentioned, and notes that he's never going to fail again. And then the voice, this force ghost voice, says to Yoda, you can't ignore me forever. And that is where issue six ends. So my friends, I hope you enjoyed that. Here's a little preview of what's going to be coming in the third arc of the Yoda comics, because I've read issues seven and eight, and it's actually during the Clone Wars, and it's to do with Anakin and even Grievous pops up and stuff. That would be a spoiler if Grievous wasn't literally on the cover of, of one of the comics, and it's been posted everywhere all online. So very cool issues. I really enjoy them. They're quite action-packed. I'm interested to see what comes from issue 9, but I'm very, very interested to see what happens in issue 10, because as far as I can tell by the artwork, it's all going to take place on Dagobah, and we're going to find out who this voice is. And according to the Marvel panel at Star Wars Celebration, it's going to be someone quite interesting that we may not have uh, seen before necessarily in that form. So very, very interesting stuff. But that, my friends, is the end of the part one of the Yoda series. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know what you thought and obviously check out, as I said, I think in the intro, episode 33 of Star Wars Comics in Canon because then you get Yoda's Secret War, which is a, I can't remember if it's four, five or six issues, but it's from the main run of Star Wars from 2015 and it's just about Yoda doing other stuff. Obviously, they're still a little bit secretive of what's been going on with Yoda, but we're slowly getting more and more stuff about Yoda. I would be intrigued to see when he joined the Jedi Order, but I assume that's probably going to be tackled in whatever initiative 
uh, Lucasfilm end up delving into after the High Republic. Michael Siglain has confirmed they already have plans for stuff post the High Republic. So I suspect it's either going to be the Young Republic, so just like post the Sith and Jedi Wars, because obviously the High Republic goes back to 382 years before the Battle of Yavin, I think it is. And the Sith Wars essentially ended around a thousand years before the Phantom Menace. So there's still like 650 years between the Sith Wars and Phase 2 of the High Republic, which has not been explored. So there's been like a little bit of stuff in the High Republic Phase 2 that lightly talks about it, but I suspect that's where they're going to focus for the next initiative. And then I suspect there's going to be a movie or a TV series or something about the Jedi Wars, about Darth Bane and Revan and all that sort of stuff. I mean, I know Revan was centuries before Bane in the Legends continuity, but I assume they're going to kind of hold off on the publishing initiative until there's been some sort of movie about the Sith and the Jedi and stuff. Because since the canon, that's been the one big thing that's been lacking. But with that all in mind, what have we got coming up and going forward? Um, I have not fully decided what I'm doing next week. I have finished the Quest for Planet X book, so I may end up doing another High Republic book review, so we're more up to date with those things. I may end up tackling the first batch of the High Republic Adventures comics. So there's the first four of those. There's going to be eight of them in total. Or I may end up tackling the second volume of the Star Wars Marvel High Republic comics. I haven't, I haven't fully decided yet. I'm trying to loosely do the High Republic in chronological order, but with Phase 2, it doesn't seem to be quite as important. Like Path of Vengeance is quite clearly the end. I'm about a fifth through it. And it clearly takes place after the Marvel comics and all that stuff. And the High Republic Adventures comics, although I am enjoying them, they seem to be completely separate to the other stuff. It's quite interesting because the High Republic Adventures comics from Phase 1 were really intertwined with all the other stuff going on. And some of the elements in it were like integral to the plot. Whereas in Phase 2 so far, although it's enjoyable, it hasn't touched upon things quite yet. But again, I've, I've only read the first few comics, so I can't actually confirm for certain. But I may do High Republic Adventures comics, I don't know. Or I may end up doing the Quest for the Planet X book review. Whichever one I do, I'll probably do the other one after that. But that, I think, is going to be enough regarding what I'm doing going forward. Obviously, if you want even more content, you can go to patreon.com slash genuine chit chat or coffee, ko-fi.com slash genuine chit chat, either one of those things, and you can get access to hours and hours of afterthoughts so i've done star wars legends book reviews on there i've also just released the thrawn and thrawn alliances book review because i'm kind of doing like a, a lead up to ahsoka kind of thing loosely so i've read the three thrawn books in the canon thrawn trilogy i'm currently like half an hour away from finishing the audiobook of heir to the empire then i'll move on to the other two books in the legends thrawn trilogy and then I might have time to read the or listen to the audiobooks of the Chiss Ascendancy trilogy, which is the second Canon Thrawn trilogy that's a prequel trilogy. So there's three Thrawn trilogies. There's the Legends one, Ed the Empire, the Canon one, which is the Thrawn trilogy, and then the Ascendancy trilogy. So I'm going to be tackling those, hopefully before Ahsoka. Obviously, there's the Star Wars Rebels Reviewed as well. So season slash episode two of that has been released as well. So that's where myself, Math, and Dave have been going through Star Wars Rebels and doing an episode per season. So... We did Series 1 before Mandalorian Series 3 came out. They made a little break because I was doing the weekly uh, Mandalorian episodes. And then we've done Series 2. Currently watching Series 3. We're hoping to record that in the next few weeks once we finish that. And then I'm hoping that Episode 4, so the finale, can be released before Ahsoka comes out as well. And then we're all kind of up to date with Ahsoka-esque stuff. So there's going to be that as well as, obviously, I said on my Patreon, I'm releasing Thrawn book reviews as well. Both the canon ones and eventually it'll be the Legends ones as well. I'm going to record my thoughts on Thrawn Treason, which is the third of the Thrawn trilogy. I said Thrawn so many times here, and I'm really sorry because it's making my brain melt. But if you want to hear some of these Star Wars Legends book reviews, you know, I do what I normally do with book reviews. I give you my thoughts on the things, then I give a spoiler warning and go through the plot details themselves, the bit more in-depth thought. So there's lots of book reviews there. There's the Darth Bane trilogy, as I mentioned, Darth Plagueis, Revan, and then also it's going to be the Thrawn books as well. I may end up releasing them on this main feed. I haven't fully decided, but at the moment they're not. So if you want to support the show, you can give us a little as one pound a month on Patreon, and then you get instant access to the entire feed of over 170 episodes there. Or if you can't contribute financially monthly, you can give a one-off donation. Even one pound would be hugely appreciated. And then I'll send you a handful of Afterthoughts episodes as well. And if you want to tell me which ones you want, if you said, I want to hear the Star Wars book reviews or this, that, or the other, just let me know and I can send them your way. If you want to support the show and you don't want to contribute financially, you can do it in a variety of other ways. You can rate and review on Spotify, Good Pods, Apple Podcasts, Audible. You can subscribe on YouTube, youtube.com slash Genuine Chit Chat, where every episode of Genuine Chit Chat and Star Wars Comics and Canon is on there, all in playlists and stuff, so it's really, really easy to find. In addition to that, you can share the show on social media, you can tell your friends all about it, 
all those ways are brilliant ways to help support this show. And then another thing that I've done recently, which I've released as well, is the Indiana Jones Comics on Trial. So myself, Tony Freena, and Scott Weatherly, the 20th Century Geek, we all got together and did another episode of Comics on Trial, which, if you're not familiar, on the feed of Comics in Motion, we did quite a few of them. I think there are like eight of them, uh, with different guests each time. And it's essentially a forum to debate. So you've got one person who's the prosecutor, one who's the defender, and then one who's the judge who makes the decision. And so we were talking about Indiana Jones, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Tony was defending it. Scott was prosecuting it and I was the judge. I will not tell you the outcome here, but go listen to that. It's a really great episode. There's a video version on YouTube as well at youtube.com slash genuine chit chat or the audio version on the feed of Comics in Motion. And if you're listening to this within the week of its release, so sort of the last week of June, you can go over to Comics in Motion's Twitter or you can go on my Twitter as well because I've shared it and you can vote in the Twitter poll as to what you think. I would recommend listening to the episode first so you hear the points that both Scott and Tony make before making that decision, but go over there and get involved but I think that is going to be enough from me here, my friends. Thank you so much for listening. As always, I appreciate each and every one of you listening, especially all the way up to the very end. Make sure to check out the show notes because basically everything I've mentioned, there'll be details of that in the description. Subscribe, share, do all that usual stuff. I'll talk to you next week, either with a book review or normal comic episode. I haven't fully decided yet. I'll kind of see how I feel next week. Uh, Thank you for your patience, obviously, because last week I didn't release this episode because everything was just a bit much. There's loads of stuff going on, but I'm back on the train. But thank you again. I'll speak to you soon. And as always, may the force be with you. The intro for Star Wars Comics and Canon is arranged by myself, Mike Burton, and the backing music was made by Eric Matias of soundimage.org. You have just experienced host, creator, everything else of genuine chit chat, and also the host and creator of Star Wars Comics and Canon found on the Comics in Motion podcast. Mike Burton.